Welcome, uh, everyone, to uh, this panel on the 2010 Census and redistricting. Uh, my name is Paul Smith from Jenner and Block here in D.C. Uh, and uh, just a few logistical preliminaries. Everybody, if you could turn off the cell phones, that would be much appreciated. Um, we will also try to end this thing in time to have 15 minutes of informal conversation on top of a more formal Q&A session, where the networking session at the end where you can talk to our illustrious panel. Um, I want to thank the sponsor of this session, Milberg LLP, very much. Uh, and with those preliminaries out of the way, let me just uh, make a little bit, bit of a more substantive introduction to our panel. Um, obviously, the census, as I'm sure you all know, is ongoing. And what that means is that we will, within a few months, be reallocating the congressional seats among the various states, immediately followed by uh, the huge political fights in most of the 50 states over redistricting uh, the various state legislative and congressional districts which will be followed like the night, the day, by a huge litigation festival, uh, which is, I guess, primarily what we're going to talk about today, the, the, the wars of 2011 and 2012 as they'll be fought out uh, around the country. Um, there are a lot of legal developments uh, in the past 10 years uh, that may affect how that, that the round of litigation and fighting goes this year, and also will affect, of course, the legislative decisions that are made in advance. Um, first, for the first time, since the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, we have a Democratic president and a Democratic Justice Department uh, at the time of redistricting, uh, putting the Democrats for the very first time in charge of pre-clearing uh, redistricting maps from those parts of the country co uh, covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, on the other hand, Section 5 uh, is also arguably under a, sh a cloud uh, because of its uh, near-death experience in the, in the Mudno case uh, a couple of years ago in, uh, in the Supreme Court. Uh, certainly there's the possibility of another constitutional challenge uh, coming along at any time um, in this, this round of cases. As for Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which of course covers uh, the entire country, the Supreme Court's recent Bartlett versus Strickland decision leaves open the possibility that Section 2 may be uh, a much less effective weapon for people challenging maps uh, than it has been in the past for a variety of reasons, which I think we'll get into. And as a result, we may well see a uh, resurgence of state constitutional arguments being made, state constitutional challenges being made uh, to the way districts are drawn. Uh, particularly, for example, if uh, the Fair Districts Initiative in Florida passes, which would completely change the playing field in that very important redistricting state. Um, of course, I think we'll end up seeing efforts once again uh, to find some way to use the Constitution to rein in partisanship in redistricting, uh, although as uh, we'll talk about it, as I'm sure most of you know, that so far those efforts have been completely a failure. Uh, mostly it has been me failing in that, as a matter of fact. But, <laughs> um, but with that said, <laughs> let me turn to more successful panelists, which is to say the rest of our panel. Uh, we have a great group here. Um, first to my immediate left is Julie Fernandez, who's the Deputy Assistant Attorney General uh, in the Civil Rights Division, uh, previously a very key player in working on the reauthorization of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act when she was the, with the Leadership Conference of Civil Rights, has a long, illustrious career before that, too, uh, although she's very young, as you can see. Uh, but that's in the, in the pro brochure. I don't want to spend a lot of time giving long biographies, which you can read, but I do encourage you to read them. To her left is Senator, uh, State Senator Letitia Vandepute from Texas, who lived through the entire war over redistricting uh, in the state of Texas uh, in, the le in the past decade uh, and got to spend a very long vacation in Albuquerque, New Mexico as a result when there was some effort to keep the vote from happening uh, on the re-re-redistricting of Congress uh, uh, in some somewhere in the middle of the decade. Uh, and she's going to give us uh, it's kind of a, the uh, politician's uh, real life experience kind of view about this whole thing. Uh, to her left is Kristen Clark, the co-director of, of the Political Participation Project for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, I've been on a lot of panels with Kristen. She's speaking on this subject a lot, but she's also one of the leading experts on, on the Voting Rights Act and redistricting in general. Next down is Nina Perales, uh, the Southwest Regional Counsel for MALDEF, who litigates redistricting cases in the Southwest, primarily Arizona, Texas, and the like, and is extraordinarily experienced and quite brilliant, as you'll see. Uh, and finally, uh, Allison Hayward, who was until about 10 days ago, was, uh, as her badge still says, was a professor at George Mason Law School where she taught election law 
She's now uh, vice president at the Center for Competitive Politics, which is an organization focusing primarily on campaign finance reform issues. But she has taught election law as an expert on the, the entire subject. Uh, and uh, is also chair of the, what do we call it, Allison? The Federal Society's Free Speech and Election Law Practice Group. Um, so with, all of, with those introductions out of the way, let me ask each of the panelists to give a kind of five-minute overview of some of the issues that, that, that you're aware of and that you're thinking about as we head toward redistricting uh, this time around. Um, starting with Julie, what's going on in the uh, Justice Department as you plan for uh, the next round of fighting over districts? Okay, great. Well, thanks, Paul, and thanks for the very young. It was my birthday on Tuesday, and I'm not ashamed. Um, I'm happy that I look very young at my... 44. Um, so uh, first, I just want to thank ACS and uh, for inviting me here to participate in this program. I am very happy to be here on this panel with so many old friends and colleagues and people who know a lot about this process and can, um, can help us mix it up and confront, talk about how we're going to confront uh, many of the challenges that Paul outlined. It's, it sounds so grim <laughs> when you talk about it. And even though I know it's real, I hear you recite the what we have in front of us, and it is just, it makes me want to go back to the office. Um, or go back so, to bed. Or go back to bed, <laughs> right. No, back to the office, because, you know, I signed up for this, so what the hell. Um, friends, it's that time of the decade again. It is redistricting time, as we all know. Most people mark the years by seasons, wedding anniversaries, birthdays. We in the voting rights world mark time by assessing how many years out we are from a new census. Our lives are dictated by this weird <laughs> curve. We are a strange band. Uh, in the Civil Rights Division, we count down the number of days before the first redistricting plan of this season will hit our collective desks. That day is closer than any of us would like to believe. By this time next year, the voting section at the Civil Rights Division will be neck deep in analyzing what we estimate will eventually be approximately 2,700 redistricting plans from around the country. And I mentioned we have a staff of 45. Mm -hmm. By our estimates, we'll receive the majority of those plans in the first 18 months after the census data is released. During my brief remarks here, I want to let you know what we're doing to make sure that we are ready. So on or around March 1st, the Census Bureau will begin releasing the results of the 2010 census to the states. It will then fall to the state legislatures and other elected officials uh, to redraw their election districts. Any jurisdiction, as you all know, that elects anyone in any type of districting system in all or part of 16 states covered by Section 5 will have to draw those new lines and submit them to us. But everybody's drawing all over the country, and some of the issues that Paul outlined around Section 2 will be relevant to them when they think about that process. So under the VRA, we have all or part of 16 states that are covered. That means that they have to either come to us or go to the DDC to have a determination made of whether that plan has the purpose or the effect of discriminating against minority voters. Most jurisdictions opt to come to us, not just because we're friendly, but because um, we're faster, we're more efficient, it's a more um, streamlined process. Um, we utilize the same, the same standard of review that the court does, and we take that job very seriously. We look to think, we, we see ourselves as sitting in the stead of the D.C. District Court and making the determination about whether or not the plan um, passes uh, the Section 5 test. Examples of what we look for in a plan, whether or not the plan, whether or not uh, the racial or ethnic minority group is packed into only one district where they might be able to elect candidates of choice in more than one, packing whether a minority group is fragmented, some call cracking, into two or more districts where they will constitute an electoral, uh, electoral minority when they could otherwise be a majority or not be a majority, elect their candidate of choice, have the ability to elect their candidate of choice, whether the percentage of minorities has been reduced in a district where they have previously been able to elect a candidate of choice by only a very slim margin. Um, none of these are hard and fast rules, of course. Each plan has to be evaluated on its facts taking into account the voting patterns and other things relevant and particular to each community. In the world of redistricting in Section 5, we don't rely on assumptions about how people vote or generalizations about how people vote. 
we look in each jurisdiction and we figure out how do people vote. And do the folks in this jurisdiction currently have the ability to elect candidates of choice? Does this plan reduce their ability, take away their ability to elect their candidate of choice? And does, is this, was this plan, or was this plan enacted with a discriminatory purpose? So we're trying to make sure we're ready. Um, and we have a lot of changes that have happened that others will talk about in the law that have made this challenge, um, um, have sort of made it, I won't say necessarily harder, but bringing in other factors. We have some new issues that are gonna make this more challenging that I know Paul is gonna drill us down on in a second. Um, first, at the end of last week, we did publish in the Federal Register pr proposed revisions to our Section 5 Administrative Review Guidelines. These guidelines provide a roadmap to the Section 5 process for jurisdictions and other stakeholders. The last time that we um, uh, updated substantively these guidelines was 1987. The revisions reflect the changes in both substance and style that resulted from the 2006 reauthorization of Section 5 in which Congress not only extended Section 5 for another 25 years, but also addressed two Supreme Court decisions on the substantive standards for compliance with Section 5. The guidelines also reflect the Supreme Court's holding in Northwest Austin, the near-death experience that Paul talked about, where the court um, held that sub-jurisdictions can bail out, so that so, so jurisdictions below the county level can bail out um, without the county. Um, the guidelines also incorporate and respond to other judicial interpretations of Section 5 issued since 1987. And they implement some technical improvements. You know, our old guidelines from 87 that we've had for so long, they still talked about magnetic tapes. They had like a P.O. box on there that we haven't used in I don't know how long. And we've actually had incidents where people have mailed things to the P.O. box. And we figure it out like months later, like, no, we don't use the P.O. box anymore. We've publicized it, but it's still in the guidelines. We're also working with the Census Bureau, another issue I'm sure we'll talk about here, to ensure that we all receive the most accurate data possible, as soon as possible, to assist in the redistricting process. This will be the first redistricting cycle since the census has changed from the long form to the annual American Community Survey. And we're hopeful that we can establish sound methodologies for doing our analyses with these new data sets. As in any year ending in one, next year will bring challenges to the voting section and to the state and local legislatures. They have plans, the legislatures, to draw and legislative deadlines to meet, and we have the responsibility to ensure that all of this is done consistent with Congress's command to protect the rights of minority voters. So I thank you all, and I look forward to our questions. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Senator, uh, what's it like when you're a senator and you have to do redistricting? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, I guess I can say honestly that I've been stacked, packed, and cracked. <laughs> <laughs> and I was part of an effort uh, to make sure that uh, mid-decade redistricting uh, that we felt was unwarranted uh, would not have such a terrible, terrible outcome. Um, but I gotta tell you, I, I wanna say thank you, first of all, uh, not only for the invitation to be here with these brilliant panelists, but for those who have come before you, who have litigated that voting rights law and that civil rights law, something very profound happened uh, in our family. And uh, I was blessed to be able to co-chair the Democratic National Convention in 2008 in Denver. And I got to take my mom with me. And every day she cried. And I didn't realize the momentous effect that that would have on her until I realized what her story was. Maybe unlike other folks, but not unlike what was typical in the South and typical what was in communities of color. You see, my mom, first time she tried to vote for president, uh, was at a college, and she was a junior in college, uh, or a sophomore, going into her, uh, about to go into her junior year, and she paid her poll tax. You know, she paid that because that was in effect at the time. But because she had a Latino last name, uh, her maiden name was Aguilar, um, she was uh, put in a group of about 12 people to take a reading test. Now, she was a college sophomore going into her junior year, but because someone in that group of 10 or 12 failed the exam, none of the 12 were allowed to vote. 
And so for a woman who was denied the right to vote for president the first time she tried, to be able to witness the affirmation and acceptance of a candidate was beyond joy for our family. And so for those of you who have made this uh, and continued in your struggle, please know that it has basis in sound history and in history that is still occurring. So first of all, thank you. And for those of um, all of you who have come before, your professors that have litigated and done that, uh, the joy on my mother's face is something that I will take forever. And that is what we need to remember. From the legislative side, it is something that we view with great ambivalence. The first part is that we're very excited to be able to take all of the new data, the new census data, and to really adhere to the one person, one vote. But that natural human instinct beyond all drives of self-preservation takes over both Democrats and Republicans. I mean, I have been in the process now in 91 and of 2001 redistricting and all the other redistrictings that were mid-decade. And I can tell you that Democrats and Republicans will eat their young in a redistricting process. It is savage. There is blood on the, your legislature's floor. And a lot of the negotiations are done with the help now of computers and great maps. But it is that, that overwhelming desire of incumbent protection can sometimes uh, make folks uh, ill at ease and provide for outcomes that aren't desirable that then end up uh, through judicial challenges that really need to be judicial challenges. Uh, the legislature uh, is made up of folks who are not just attorneys, uh, as you can see here. I mean, I'm a pharmacist. Come talk to me about how to take your medication. I can do that. I know that there are folks on my staff and uh, with the help in our legislative council who understand all the court cases and what I need to do legally. And what I understand is that I have to give the people and draw maps that will give them the opportunity to elect the person of their choice. Now, my state of Texas, we're probably going to get four new congressmen. Uh, that's because of our growth, and the growth has been Latino growth. And in fact, the growth throughout the country has been Latino growth. If you think about the number of increase of minorities um, and the growth just from 2007 to 2008, out of every two people, one was a Hispanic. And that is profound change from the 1990s when you can see this. It's not just about the maps. It's about education policy. It's about human resources. It's about health care. So what begins with lines on a map has definite income because it affects policy. It affects people's livelihoods. It affects their ability to have the opportunity. So the maps are the beginning. They're the maps that contain the lines of jurisdictions of who will vote for whom and their ability to select the candidate of their choice. But in selecting the candidate of their choice, they affect public policy. And that's why this is real. It is high stakes. And all I can tell you is having um, had the opportunity to lead my Democratic caucus, on a quorum break uh, for 48 days, uh, and yes, we went to Albuquerque, um, New Mexico, at Wanda Resort. It was the Marriott with the plastic plants. <laughs> but I can tell you that it was well worth it. Uh, we had to stay out of the state uh, because we were under arrest warrants, and had we gone back, we would have been forced back to the, into the chamber. It was the only way that we could stop uh, what we figured was an illegal redistricting plan and a power grab and to give the folks to time to get to court, to file those suits. All I can tell you is the outcome, uh, thanks to Nina and her crew and, and uh, a lot of folks, uh, was more positive. Um, and on a personal note, I wear those scars proudly. I can tell you that fighting con then Congressman Tom DeLay was a political risk, but it was the right thing to do. And if you look now, Mr. DeLay is wearing pink sequins, and the only gig he can get is Dancing with the Stars. And I'm still in the Texas Senate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Kristen, uh, if you 
What, what's your perspective on where we're going this That's time? That's my perspective. Good morning, first of all. I want to um, first start off by thanking ACS and LaShawn Warren for organizing this very important and timely panel. And I can't start by, without first observing that, you know, I, I speak on panels from time to time, but it's rare I get to speak on a panel with powerhouse women uh, like <laughs> these four ladies here. So this is a really <laughs> exceptional opportunity. And, and we got Paul moderating. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> It's a tough All right. crowd. So this is, um, I think, a really exciting time <laughs> for those who um, do voting rights or interested in voting rights. I think redistricting is absolutely the most exciting time to be doing this work. Um, it's also the best and the worst of time. So where are we at in 2010? Uh, this actually is the 45th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. We've had the um, uh, the act that is widely regarded as the most important and successful federal civil rights law ever passed by Congress in place, 45 years strong. The act is what helped create the conditions that gave, made it possible for us to have a Barack Obama. And we have the act's protections in place going into this next redistricting cycle. So that's a good thing. We also got the mud victory last year, and many people on the table here um, were involved in that effort. Um, the uh, small utility district in Austin, Texas sought to gut the heart of the Voting Rights Act and we got a ruling that leaves Section 5's uh, protections in place, which is very important, I think, on the eve of redistricting. But it's also the worst of times because constitutional challenges uh, continue to rear their head. In the last two months, there have been some significant developments. We've got a constitutional challenge that's been filed by uh, some white plaintiffs in uh, North Carolina, and we've got another challenge that's been filed by Shelby County, Alabama, uh, seeking to strike down Section 5. And those cases uh, may ultimately be unsuccessful, but it does kind of put us in a precarious position. But we've got to fight and work to make sure that this uh, important and key law is in place for the redistricting cycle. And um, I want to talk about some of the developments that have happened concerning the Voting Rights Act over the past decade. Um, we've got another ruling that was recently issued by the Supreme Court, Bartlett versus Strickland. This was a case that arose out of North Carolina and concerned the question of whether majority minority districts under the Voting Rights Act means just that, districts that have to be at least 50% or more uh, minority in their composition. The issue in North Carolina was whether a, a district that was comprised of about 39% of African Americans, where there had been a history of reliable crossover support from white voters, could be viewed as a district entitled to protection under um, Section 2, a core provision of the Voting Rights Act. The court ruled uh, by a margin of 5 to 4 that Section 2 um, uh, litigants in future cases have to show that they would constitute at least 50% of a district in order to bring um, a claim. That's a kind of threshold requirement that needs to be met going forward in future Section 2 cases. But I think it's very important for us to be wary of the Bartlett decision and how it's interpreted and applied on the ground uh, by legislators going forward. So let's talk about what Bartlett doesn't mean. Um, Bartlett is not an invitation to dismantle districts that are less than 50 percent, uh, 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 less than 50 percent minority in their composition. Many congressional black caucus members, for example, sit in districts that are less than 50 percent black. These districts are very important. Many of these are, uh, the, you know, uh, districts represent the most diverse districts uh, in our country, represent areas where we're seeing lots of cross-racial um, support, lots of white voters crossing over and supporting black uh, voters' candidates of choice. And this is a healthy thing for our democracy. So I think it's important that we be wary of how legislators interpret Bartlett and make sure that it's not viewed as an invitation to dismantle these very important influence and coalition districts, as we call them. Um, also, uh, the Bartlett Court didn't suggest that legislators not uh, work to create or endeavor to create these districts in redistricting. So I hope that in those parts of the country where we've uh, seen significant minority population growth over the past decade, that legislators will endeavor to create these influence and coalition districts, which again are a very healthy thing. 
also there's some very important language from Justice Kennedy in Bartlett that I want to I want to share. He observes that racial discrimination and racially polarized voting are not ancient history. Much work remains to be done to ensure that citizens of all races have equal opportunity to share and participate in our democratic processes and traditions. So this is this Supreme Court observing that discrimination is something that we continue to encounter. It's still a part of our political reality. And I know that there's some commentators out there who suggest that we've entered a post-racial era where we're no longer confronting uh, these problems, but that's anything but the case. The 2008 presidential uh, election, in fact, exemplifies the racially polarized voting that continues to be pr uh, 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 particularly stark in many places. If you look at the 2008 presidential election contest and how it played out state by state, you see that many of the jurisdictions that are covered by Section 5 um, are places where we saw the most stark, starkest levels of polarized voting. In Mississippi, only 10 percent of white voters crossed over to support Obama, 11 percent in Alabama, and 14 percent in Louisiana. This, I think, is evidence of how very important and necessary Section 5 um, remains. Let me close by just pointing out one other problem that I think uh, we've got to be wary of going into 2010, and that's the problem of prison-based gerrymandering. The Census Bureau currently counts incarcerated persons where they're held and detained rather than at their home addresses. And this is in spite of the fact that many states have constitutional or statutory provisions stating that incarcerated persons remain legal residents of the place where they lived prior to arrest. Uh, this is a, a, a significant problem that hasn't gotten uh, much attention over the past uh, several decades and one that we're really hoping that states will um, uh, uh, focus on in 2010. It has the effect of inflating population numbers and thus political representation of the districts where prisons and jails are located. It distorts the 14th Amendment principle of one person, one vote. And communities of color suffer the most uh, because of this problem. In uh, the U.S., the incarcerated population is comprised disproportionately of persons of color. Black folks, for example, make up 12 percent of the general population, but are 41.3 percent of federal and state prison populations. And the dilution of minority voting strength that results uh, from this, I think, is something that may be actionable under Section 2, and so states should be wary. Um, the Census Bureau is actually making it easier for states to correct the problem in the next redistricting cycle. They will, for the very first time, release data on what's called group quarter residents, uh, which includes prisoners. Uh, and they're going to do so in time for states and localities to use that information in the redistricting process. So it will be actually possible to count prisoners in their, um, in their true homes. And uh, Maryland is one of the very first states that has taken some real steps to address this problem. They recently adopted a bill that will now require the state to redistrict by drawing, uh, by counting prisoners in their homes and not in the places where they're detained. Uh, let me just give you an illustration of how this plays out. In New York, for example, 66% of the state's prisoners come from the city, from New York City. But 91%, 91% of them are incarcerated in rural uh, upstate New York. If you were to count those folks in New York City, it would mean that seven, currently seven New York state Senate districts would not meet one person, one vote requirements. And let's look at how this plays out in rural America. Um, in 2002, the town of Anamosa, Iowa, was divided into four city council wards, for example, about 1,370 people each. But one of the wards contained a state penitentiary that housed 1,320 prisoners. So as a result, this ward truly had 50 constituents but held the same amount of political power as the other uh, three districts housing 1,370 people. A real problem, a real crisis. We've produced a guide that hopefully many of you have received um, that provides more information and detail to help uh, those who may be interested in advocacy around this. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. That's a really interesting issue. Uh, Nina. Thank you, Paul. I would like to thank ACS for having me speak today. And I would like to thank Paul for his wonderful introduction. Uh, I want to uh, con continue with the young part, <clears throat> because you may not know that Julie and I were born in the same year. 
That makes uh, you I both also very turned young. 44. And in fact, 1966 was a fantastic year for voting rights lawyers. Not only were, was Julie born in 66 and I was born in 66, but Debo Degbele, who successfully <laughs> argued the Mudd case, was also born in 1966. He is the baby of our group. Um, <laughs> so I encourage you all, aspiring voting rights lawyers, to find other people <clears throat> born in your year <laughs> and create um, dynamic trios or groups of four or five um, to go out and do voting rights litigation. It's worked for us, um, even though we've shifted in our jobs, as you can see. I'm um, taking over applications time. for people born in the 70s. Yeah, I was going to say, um, <laughs> some people are just too young to be a part of our little clique. Uh, or too young. You can take comfort, though, that you're younger. In any event, I'm wasting my time. Uh, as you know, or maybe don't know, uh, Maldiv has been involved in redistricting throughout the Southwest since the 1970s, uh, specifically in Texas, where my office is based. Uh, we have litigated redistricting in every round since the 1970s. So we have litigated redistricting in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, <clears throat> the 2000s, and then the re-redistricting of 2003. In the most recent round of redistricting in 2000, uh, MALDEF, uh, in all of our offices, litigated statewide redistricting cases in California, Arizona, and Texas. I am very excited about the upcoming redistricting. I know some people are worried, some people are sad. You know, people work with the government wringing their hands, oh my goodness, how are we going to process all those preclearance applications? <clears throat> I'm really, really excited to get out there and do redistricting. Uh, some of the issues that are um, that confront the Latino community that are special for our community, since I'll, I'll add those in, very reflective of, of the senator's comments. We are a fast-growing population. Wherever we are, we're growing fast. Uh, we bring congressional seats to the states in which we live, or we help states maintain congressional seats in apportionment that they otherwise would have lost. I'll give you an example. In Texas, in 2000, Texas picked up two congressional seats in apportionment. Now, those two seats, when you hear Senator Van de Putt say Latinos brought those seats, I'll give you the numbers behind that. Anglos in Texas grew from 1990 to 2000 by 640,000. Latinos in the same period grew by 2.3 million. We brought those two congressional seats to Texas, and we will be responsible for bringing the three or four new congressional seats to Texas in this new round of apportionment. And if you take a look at any of the maps that are up on the internet that show which states are losing and which ones are gaining, you're going to see zeros and ones across the entire co country, plus one, minus one, zero, 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 and then you're going to see big plus four on Texas. And as far as I'm concerned, the Latino community is responsible for that gain. It also means that in redistricting, we're in the very exciting position of looking at drawing new districts as opposed to holding the line uh, in other places. So when we look at redistricting, we look at it as a possibility for um, gaining fairness in districting, because typically we're growing throughout the decade, and redistricting is an opportunity for us to catch up with, uh, with our political potential. It's a wonderful, exciting time for us. Uh, we also have to deal, however, with efforts to change the way that redistricting is done in ways that can potentially harm the Latino community or limit its political power. The first example I'll give you is the shift to redistricting commissions. You may hear people speak in positive terms about shifting from legislative redistricting to commission-based redistricting, and there may be positive aspects to that. But I will tell you about another aspect to it, which is that it strips Latino influence from the redistricting process. In 2000, the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission had no Latinos on it. Now, you know there's a lot of Latinos in Arizona, because everybody's talking about Arizona these days. Uh, but no Latinos on the Independent Redistricting Commission helping to draw the districts in a state that at that time was about 20%. Latino. In 2010, California will do its redistricting by commission. The California Assembly is about 20, 22 percent Latino. At this stage in the selection process for the California Redistricting Commission, Latinos represent somewhere around 10 percent of the candidate pool. And you know there's it's sort of a bunch of very complicated stages and steps that have to be gone through to select the members of the commission. But at this point, the pool is down to about 622 individuals only about 10% at best are Latinos. So you compare, that's about a 50% drop in the number of Latinos that are going to be a part of this process at best, if the number doesn't keep going down as the commission is made smaller. I spoke to one of my young attorneys in Los Angeles uh, this morning as he was writing in, and I told him, I'm going to go talk to ACS. What do you want me to say about the California Commission? And he said, and I promised I would deliver this message, 
that it's a sham to call this an increase in democracy, that it will be government by bureaucrats. The state auditor is choosing people who are not accountable to anybody through the political process and to voters, and who themselves will be so heavily reliant on the technical support that's provided to the commission that this cannot in any way be called an improvement in democracy. So just take that for what it's worth. I know there's lots of opinions on it, uh, just so you know. And then finally, another attempt to change the way that redistricting is done, and this one is aimed specifically at Latinos, and that is uh, uh, changing the way uh, that one person, one vote is interpreted. You've heard Kristen talk about one person, one vote implications with respect to prison population. And the message there is that people should be counted for apportionment where they live. Now here's another example of an attempt to twist and warp it in a way specifically to disadvantage Latinos. There's a test case that's been filed in Texas called Lepac versus City of Irving in which the plaintiffs seek a ruling not really from the district court judge. They're aiming for the Fifth Circuit and ultimately the U.S. Supreme Court. A ruling that would say that apportionment should not be done on the basis of total population, meaning that districts should not have the same number of individuals in them. We've had that rule since the 1960s, the, the concept of, of equal numbers of people in each district. Instead, this group of plaintiffs seeks a ruling that would say there should be equal numbers of citizen voting age population in each district, which means that some districts could be as maybe twice as large as other districts in terms of their total population because they have higher numbers of children proportionally or higher numbers of non-citizens. Now if you talk to any elected representative and ask, would you like to have twice as many people uh, you know, seeking your representation in your district, twice as many people that you have to take care of and provide constituent services for, who also probably happen to live in areas that have higher infrastructure, education, social service and other needs, or would you rather have a normal sized district? I think you can all guess the answer to that. And uh, this, of course, as I mentioned before, is I think a specific strategy that's developed in response to the burgeoning Latino population and increasing political strength among Latinos. So um, Maldef is counsel. We're actually uh, defendant interveners. We're on the defense side of that case. Uh, and you can uh, watch it in the news and see how it goes. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Uh, Allison? Well, like the other panelists, I would like to thank the American Constitution Society for inviting me today. Um, I am not simply the loyal opposition here on this panel and the Federal Society person, but I'm also the representative from, let's hear it for 1963. Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? 1963. <laughs> My mom was still in the hospital when uh, President Kennedy was assassinated, so I'll even give you the month in 1963. Um, so I'm feeling old. Oh well. Um, I just want to make, I guess, a couple of observations and clean up um, in no particular order of priority. Um, it's just the order that I thought of them. Um, in terms of managing the census, um, and um, I, I hope I'm not, I don't surprise anyone with this view, but it is a view that I'm not all my, my colleagues share um, on my side of the aisle. Um, I don't think there's a substitute for the principle that you count everyone where they are on April 1st, 2010. Because you need that number. What you do with that number is up, to, is, is up to debate, but you need that number. And so the notion that we don't count people um, because they're not citizens or we count people in one place other than the other, let's start with the proposition that we count everyone where they are on April 1st as best we can. Um, now, we, what do you use that number for? Well. You know, I think I think that's where the discussion gets interesting. Um, you know, what do you do with people who aren't anywhere within the 50 states on April 1st, but are Americans? What do you do with Mormon missionaries? Utah's excited about that issue. Uh, what do you do about other expatriates who still feel that they might be Americans, but are oh diplomats or business folk living overseas, or or, or have dual citizenship and are living overseas? What do you do about people who are stationed overseas as members of the military? Um, you know, and we don't treat these classifications all the same. We don't have one rule that says, you know, everybody who's a citizen gets a place in the U.S. for the census. And we don't have a rule that says that none of them do. We have, you know, we, they're different. 
Um, and there's there's rationales for that, but still, you know, the, the census number isn't isn't as clean as it might appear. Certainly, the problems with prisoners, um, with students, um, with folks on bases within the U.S. Um, and I, I guess my my the sort of wisdom I would draw from this is we need the census number to tell us where people are on April 1st. But maybe the number we for use for reapportionment and redistricting is different from that number. I think if we, if we start talking that way, it depoliticizes the census a little bit and puts the pressure on the decision makers who are doing redistricting and reapportionment decision making. Um, that is the political actors or in some places um, commissions who are part of the messy part. Um, I would really like to see, um, this is probably uh, uh, sort of a pie in the sky thing, I would really like the census to become as um, much, uh, as, as little of a political football as possible. Because I think we need, we do, this, the statisticians and decision makers and people who are allocating, you know, revenue and um, trying to plan for services and trying to plan for infrastructure need to know where people are. Everybody. Okay. So that's, that's my one sort of out there point. Um, not necessarily following that from that, though, um, but I do want to say about redistricting. Um, um, I will make a contrarian statement at this time uh, <laughs> because that's my job here on this panel. And also, I believe it. Um, I think the one person, one vote principle in Randall v. Sims is nice as a goal or as a philosophy, but as literally as it's been taken in subsequent decisions, I think it's got a pernicious effect. Um, it doesn't prevent line drawing machinations at the in state houses across the country, especially now that we have laptops that are more powerful than the mainframes that, that put the man on the moon. Um, it doesn't yield uniform districts nationally, obviously, because we have state boundaries that cut off little piles of people. And so the, the congressional districts that are one person, one vote drawn in Nevada are not the same size as the ones that are one person, one vote drawn in Wisconsin or in Alabama or in Florida. Um, so you still have a variation in population. Um, I, I can't get my head around why it is that we can tolerate that at the national level, but we can't tolerate that within the state. I think the answer is, oh, but if you give people some, some, some leeway, they'll just be even worse when they're um, gerrymandering than now where at least we have this one judicially manageable standard that we can press on top of a gerrymander and, um, and impose some sort of discipline on state houses. Well, maybe, um, but I, I don't see a lot of th that discipline in the first instance, so I'm not sure how this, uh, this very strict standard has really helped, and to the extent that it um, doesn't allow for districting on other sorts of traditional districting grounds that we would embrace, things like you know, communities of interest and county lines or whatever it might be. Um, so. Um, I also, um, I, th I think the city of Irving challenge is interesting because it's bringing up sort of this, this latent point in, in districting, which is even if you have equal populations, there's vast differences in the representational experience of people representing districts where you've got um, you know, large voter turnout and <coughs> districts where you don't, districts where you've got you know, a lot of civic engagement in districts where you don't. Um, and that, that's just life, that's politics. There's no solution for that, um, except that I think what the city of Irving case is bringing up is, well, okay, in Reynolds v. Sims, the court talked about one person, one vote, and the, and the value of a vote shouldn't change based on where you lived. Well, presupposing that voter value is, is sort of the thing that, that we should be tipping off when we're looking at, at um, districting, Maybe there's a place for a conversation about whether voting eligible population or voting age population is a, is a you know, legitimate um, basis, um, especially, especially if in um, places that are covered by um, the Voting Rights Act, you also have a non-retrogression principle, and so you have to work through that. Um, I, anyway, to, to, to get back to my sort of, um, my, uh, my, my plea for the census becoming less political, I think if you backed off one person, one vote, the what to do about some people and how to count them becomes a little less urgent, and maybe that too would um, lead uh, the census um, treatment to become a little less political. Um, because districting is going to be ugly. Um, it's really ugly in states where you lose a seat. 
That's a sad, that's a sad thing. In Texas, you got four seats, you can argue about who gets the goods, but at least, you know, the pie is growing. Um, shrinking, you know, Midwestern and, and you know, Northeastern states, that's painful. I, I mean, Pennsylvania may be not as painful because one of the people who might be affected is no longer with us, God rest his soul. But um, in other states, you've got, you have the real possibility of a state legislature sitting down, looking at its congressional district and figuring out who's not gonna have a job. And even in you know a single party situation, or you know where where the, the same party controls um, the delegation to Congress as well as you know that state houses. In fact, that's probably even more painful because you're talking about you know taking somebody who's who's a leader of your party and telling them they no longer have a job. Um, so, California Citizens Commission or any sort of independent citizens commission, whether it be you know retired federal judges or people chosen out of the phone book or people chosen by the state auditor or me or whoever, you, um, somebody other than the state legislature. Well, you know, the, the idea, the ideal is you take the politics out of this and you get something that looks a little more like, you know, an administrative decision about how to carve districts up in a way that is sensible from um, the various goals that you have in, in, in representation and governance and so communities of interest, you're not, you know, packing, you're not cracking, you're not, you know, drawing lines that reach clear across the state, all those kinds of things. Um, but it, uh, it does take the responsiveness out of the process because you don't have the elected officials anymore. So you know, there aren't any good answers here. You either have you know, politically driven elected officials and the ugly things they do, or you have citizens who probably don't know that much about what they're doing under the uh, you know, direction and control of um, you know, the state auditors, statisticians, in a way that's not responsive and not political in the good sense. Um, maybe there's less blood in that process though. Um, I think the jury's out on the California Commission. I think, I think it's kind of gimmicky but, um, but if it yields um, a map in California that um, serves people in California, then um, I'm not gonna complain too much about it. Um, what else was I gonna say? Um, and then finally, I think the, the thing that I wrestle with, and I wrestle with when I'm, when I'm trying to teach um, the um, voting rights material and talk about communities of interest and um, communities you know, representing the can or electing the candidate of their choices, it's so hard to separate partisan patterns from um, racial and ethnic patterns. Um, I think that's too bad. Um, I wish um, the Republican Party were more diverse. I'll say it, but, um, but it's not. And so when you look at communities um, in say um, the South being polarized and they're voting for president, that, that can be because white um, voters in the South are conservative or it can be because white voters in the South are racially biased. I mean, both of those, or both of those could be true, but it's very hard for me anyway to figure out a way that you unpack one from the other when there's such a close identity um, in the two phenomena. Um, and, uh, but it's worth trying to, to, to figure that one out because I don't think um, we uh, really have a, a national interest in preventing um, partisanship the way we have a national interest in preventing, preventing racial bias. And with that, I'm gonna stop. Thanks a lot, Allison. Uh a few questions. Uh, let me start with you, Julie, since uh, okay. you're right here. Um, there was a perception uh, 10 years ago, a perception that certainly I shared, that the preclearance process was um, somewhat used for political purposes on occasion, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps the decisions were somewhat selective based on who was, whose ox was being gored. Uh, what, what, if anything, is the Justice Department doing to try to prevent that kind of abuse of the process this time around? Well, I think I, the answer is... I didn't tell is, you I was coming up with that question. <laughs> yeah, I know, I didn't know. But I mean, I, I think the answer is that we're just going to do our job. I mean, I can't speak to what happened when I wasn't there, and I don't really know a lot about um, what was motivating. I can't pretend to sort of look into what was motivating people at the time, and I'm certainly very aware from my time not in government of the concern about um, bias in the preclearance process. But I think what I can say is that, um, you know, we take very seriously the fact that this is, redistricting is all about politics, right? And everybody, voting rights is all about politics. So at a certain point, whatever decision we make, some political entity is gonna say, you're doing that to not help us. And sometimes Democrats will say that and sometimes Republicans will say that the history of our enforcement is that we get attacked by everybody. 
for having bias, political bias in our decision making. And I think that our, um, my approach and our approach is to just, I tell the folks in the voting section, uh, we should just put on our duck suits because we're going to get attacked um, by everybody. But if we keep our eye on the prize, which is the Voting Rights Act, the protection of minority voters, the facts on the ground, and not worry about and try not to even appreciate uh, the political fallout of our decisions, that's the best we can do. But what we can't do, I think, is to sort of not do what we think is right on the law because we're concerned that Democrats or Republicans are going to call us biased. We just have to call them and then um, keep moving. That'll be a refreshing change. <laughs> um, Senator, uh, is the state of Texas going to be the epicenter again this time around, or is it going to be a different place this time? Well, I think Texas has been an epicenter of a lot of the cases, certainly every all the eyes uh, in the uh, Voting Rights Act were all on the, the MUD case, the Municipal Utility District case, and we've had some very strong cases coming out of Texas, but that's because we got such characters there. I mean, um, and the reason is uh, we've had national leadership uh, from Texas, and, and really what was at stake in the re redistricting 2003 effort was the control of the U.S. House of Representatives. And so what seemed like a small effort on maybe five to seven districts in drawing in 2001 when we already had a, a, a Republican court that said, yeah, these are valid lines in, of the 2001 lines, was difficult to digest and to understand if you were just looking at lines on a map. But the ramifications was control of the U.S. House and trying to switch seven more seats. Um, that's what was at stake. So they're always going to be high stakes. Um, I think it doesn't matter whether you are gaining seats or losing seats in that it is always a high stakes. Even when you're gaining seats, you're gaining them in areas of the high growth. And therefore, even though Texas is going to get three for sure, probably four, Republican congressmen that represent rural West Texas, they can't sustain what they have now. And so even though we gain, there's a huge realignment. And that's what I think is the fallacy is that folks think, oh, well, if you're getting seats or you gain population, everybody should be happy. Wrong, 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 so wrong. Because it's where those people are living. And not that our rural areas of West Texas or even East Texas have not grown in population, they have, but they've only grown in two or three percent. Whereas there have been some counties that have a 20 percent growth. And that's where it's, so it's the shifting. Um, it's always political. It's always uh, somewhat painful uh, because there are definite winners and losers. What we have to make sure is that as map drawers and as the folks that vote on it, that we take the body of law both from section two, section five, and we take the court cases and we draw what we think is the best in accordance with the law. Take into effect what those population growths are and the trends. And then we know that if somebody doesn't like it, well, it's gonna end up in court anyway. And so our, I guess from a legislator's point of view, you know, the, the way that normally your legislatures work is the House votes on its own lines, the Senate votes on its own lines, and then most of the time, at least for Texas, Congress ends up in court. Um, and that gives us a little bit of, uh, of, of comfort in that we know that whatever we do, there is a higher step. <clears throat> there is a greater call. There is that judicial aspect and that where people can get their fair say. And that's what the system is about. Um, so I look for it, I mean, it's gonna be tough, but understand all of your state legislatures coming in in 2011, this is one layer extra. We have record budget shortfalls, huge budget shortfalls. And so your legislatures are in 
in a precarious situation in that all of the districts are going to be losers because we can't bring as much dollars to you know, K through 12 and higher ed and all of the intervention and prevention programs, whether it be public health, the environment, workforce readiness, they're all being eliminated. So you've got this overlay in the 2011 session and where it gets personal. It gets personal because you may have to draw a line that eliminates the seat of your best friend. That's where it gets personal. Um, who knows what will happen in certain states? And I hope that at least what, what we're worried about is that the body of law that we have now, maybe it stays stable enough for us to be able to draw lines that seems in less than a year. <laughs> given past experience. It, but <laughs> at least so we can draw the lines. But what, what, you, what is our nightmare is that we're drawing lines and a court case comes down that throws out the assumption of the very basis of what we're doing. And then you have to start from, again, from yeah. the first... Uh, uh, little uh, jurisdictions. Uh, anyway, it's going to be exciting. Uh, it's going to be hurtful. And it's one where your legislatures uh, are already in preparation. So know that we don't just all of a sudden get to the legislative session and this is happening. We've got workshops. There, there are things that have been happening in preparation for this so that we can be at least with the best possible knowledge of the tasks that we have to do for the people. Thank you. Uh, Kristen, you mentioned uh, the levels of polarization that still exist in the Deep South, uh, black-white racial polarization in voting. Um, as you know, of course, uh, the requirement of bringing a claim into Section 2 of the voting, voting Rights Act is showing that there's a sufficient degree of polarization in the local area where the district is that you're trying to get the court to draw. Uh, do you think that we're going to see in the coming round a great deal of argumentation being done outside the Deep South about th that there isn't enough any longer enough polarization in voting between blacks and whites to allow Section 2 to still have any uh, re relevance at all to the way di districts are drawn, particularly, of course, in the wake of the election of President Obama? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's possible. I mean, the one thing that I worry about with the um, Obama presidential election is people making blanket presumptions that racially polarized voting no longer exists. Because there isn't guesswork involved here. It's, you know, this is a question that's generally answered by experts, experts who crunch extensive you know, election data, match that with racial demographic data to you know, figure out uh, what voting patterns are really like on the ground in jurisdictions and whether or not you've got racially polarized voting. Right, but the, voting. the experts can't answer the question of how polarized it has to be. And the Supreme Court in the Bartlett case has some dicta that suggests even if blacks are voting 80 percent this way and white, whites are voting 80 percent this way, that's not enough. I don't know if, that's, if you think that's going to be Yeah, important. that Kennedy dicta definitely <laughs> is, um, is troublesome. It definitely, I think, sets the bar far higher than it's been in traditional voting rights right. cases and is something that we've got to uh, I think keep our eye on. Fortunately, it's just dicta and not the rule. And um, I think that it's going to be very important uh, for people not to make blanket presumptions about what the 08 presidential election means. We've got to look beyond presidential elections to the patterns that are emerging in state and local contests. You know, there are many places where we're seeing a backlash response to the 08 presidential election. Many black mayors in a number of jurisdictions have lost their seats, and there are some who are attributing this to kind of a backlash response to America having a black president. So I, anyway, I think that we've got to be very scientific and comprehensive in our approach to this question and, um, and engage experts in the process. Hmm. Nina. Um, do you think that anybody's uh, around the country going to actually take up this idea of only looking at citizens in the one person, one vote calculation and draw districts that way? If they did, what would happen? Well, <clears throat> if they did, it depends on where they do it. Um, if it's a place where the citizenship rates are uniform across the jurisdiction, whether they're high or low, it's not going to have that much of an impact. And there places even within Texas where the citizenship rates are uniform um, in such a way that it wouldn't have that much of an impact. Where it will have an impact is in places where there are uh, concentrated areas of non-citizens, of course living interspersed with citizens, because there is no place where everybody is not a citizen, even along the U.S.-Mexico border. These are interspersed populations, and so the effect is to pack districts with human beings um, 
in a way that I think makes it very difficult to get representation, in a way that I think makes it very difficult to represent the districts, and which is uh, very harmful to both the non-citizens living there, as well as the citizens who continue to have interests. And <clears throat> this is also true for places where there are variations uh, between who is a child and who is an adult, because the standard that's being sought in the LEPAC case includes both citizenship and voting age as factors. So in places where there are more children, which also happens to be in the Latino community, you're also going to see an effect of packing districts in a way that's very harmful. Will people try it? Uh, I don't know. In this case, the city of Irving redistricted and apportioned its districts in the regular way, using total population. It was the, it's the challengers who have brought this lawsuit to force redistricting in a different way. Um, so it, it will be interesting to see if any jurisdictions themselves make a make an attempt at that. Yeah, it does seem unlikely that you could force a, a jurisdiction to use the alternative method uh, if they don't want to. But if they did try mm -hmm. it, it's not only going to be clear to me that what, what the courts will do. You, know, you never know what the courts are going to do these days, yeah. especially the big one. Um, the, one of the problems with it, though, doing it at least at the beginning of the decade, is you'd have to have citizenship data that was sufficiently exact that you could feel like you're, you're satisfying the one person, one vote requirement by just looking at citizens. I mean, could you just, for the, for the group, mm -hmm talk a little bit about what the citizenship change is. I, I know it was mm -hmm. mentioned by Julie or something, but, but what's going on with data from the census on citizenship? Well, we've had a change in the way that the census uh, records or takes up uh, information about people besides the total count. As you all know, because I know you all participated in the decennial census. Uh, since none of you probably live in Colonias or other places like Colonias, you probably got something in the mail. You filled it out, you returned it. If you were naughty and you didn't, somebody came to your house and recorded the information about you. Um, if you did happen to be in a colonia, you may still be waiting for somebody to come to your door. Uh, the census has had some challenges in Texas that I'm not very happy about. Uh, but as a result, you know that everybody is counted in the decennial census, but there's been a change in the way that other characteristics are counted, and that includes social and economic characteristics, that includes housing, it includes citizenship, um, and those characteristics are now being counted not in the decennial census using what we used to call the long form, but instead are counted in a rolling census where samples of people are um, given questionnaires on a rolling basis every two years. So we have different kind of citizenship and other data to work with in this redistricting round when compared to the last redistricting round, and the sample size is smaller. And I think there are going to be some challenges at very small levels of geography uh, in figuring out or getting really good, reliable estimates on some of these social and economic and housing characteristics, including citizenship. And do you think that's going to have a major impact on the litigation, or is that just going to be something everybody will figure out how to live with? I think that people will figure out whether it helps them to argue <laughs> that it will have a major impact on litigation. Maybe it'll be you, Paul. Couldn't <laughs> Maybe be. it'll be me. Um, but somebody will, I'm sure. I just don't know who it is yet because I don't think people have figured out where the political advantage lies, it's particularly with the parties. Uh, right. They will figure out where their political advantage lies and then argue accordingly. Yeah. Allison, what, what would you do to the one person, one vote standard? Would you? make it more like the state legislative standard where you can have kind of a 10% variation from district to district in, how, in the population? Would you apply that to Congress? Is that kind of what you're Yeah, I'd loosen it. Uh, I mean, you know, remember the, 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 the genesis of, of Reynolds v. Sims was, you know, they hadn't redistricted for the century. You know, it was, it was sort of, it was you know, in a, of a continuum of bad legislative behavior. They were kind of way out on one end. Um, and, um, and when you read the, the, the case, you know, the, the court's trying to grapple with, well, we want, to, we, want, we want state legislatures to behave better. And we want them to, to do, and that means redistricting after a census. And then we want them to use that population information, you know, in a way that breaks up these, these sort of rotten borough type um, jurisdictions and, and, and gives a, a, a sort of more even cast to things. But, that, that in subsequent decisions it had to be sort of literally exact is just, is at the other end of the spectrum, in my view. And so yes, I think, I think that that case law and that interpretation is the stuff that needs to be walked back. Um, and, um, you know, I'm not sure, 
I'm not sure how far back it needs to be walked, but I mean, there needs to be some standard there. And, and yeah, the one that, that we applies get, to state legislatures might not be a bad one. We did get the Pennsylvania map held unconstitutional by a federal court because there was a variation of three voters from district to district. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, it didn't accomplish very much. They fixed it in about a week and a half, but it, it was a. Uh, it is remarkably exact, the requirements for a one person, one vote for congressional districts, especially given the inexactness of the census. You could make an argument that the whole thing yeah. is, is and like... And the population variance of congressional districts among states, which is quite large. Also true. <laughs> also true. Um, so, what are you, so what are you getting with this game, you know? Where's the candle? You know? Let me ask you another question, Allison. Do you think that the, the Supreme Court, as you know, has said in Veith that uh, partisan gerrymandering is a justiciable equal protection claim, but we have no idea what the standard you have to meet is. At least the fifth vote didn't know what that was, which is Justice Kennedy. So now we have a justiciable claim with no law to apply. Uh, do you think that the Supreme Court will ever come around to actually recognizing a claim enough to actually say that something is too extreme uh, to be unconstitutional as a partisan gerrymander? No. No, listen, you see. No, I, 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 I think they, they, they don't know what to do with Davis v. Vandemer, and so they continue to, to, to kick up dust about, well, there's the partisan gerrymander out there. Maybe, we think, but we haven't seen it. And why do you, no, think, I, I, why I think, do you think there's such a reluctance to recognize the problem? I think it, problem? Gets, it gets back to your whole kind of underlying problem of judicial, judicially manageable standards in a, in a process that has to be political. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to channel Justice Frankfurter and Cole Grove v. Green here at all, um, but there's that, this is where that concern really, I think, is most acute, is because you know, we do have you know, a, a, a duopoly in partisan affiliations, and that really shows up when you're trying to craft districts. Um, let me ask one or two more questions, and then we'll open it up to the group uh, here to ask some questions. Um, Kristen, do you, you said you don't think that the Bartlett case is an invitation to start dismantling the districts out there, uh, including many members of the Black Caucus, which are less than 50% African American. Uh, could you tell us why you, th you don't think it's an invitation to do that and whether you think people will in fact try to do that or uh, maybe not so much Congresses and state legislative? You, I think we're going to start seeing people's districts getting carved up. Yeah, well, I, the Bartlett rule, I think, is definitely a perspective-looking rule. This is a, a rule that must be satisfied by litigants who are now going into court trying to bring, you know, Section 2 cases. This is a threshold requirement that they have to meet. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the case may be dismissed. But I think that there clearly is language in Bartlett that suggests that if you isolate and target existing districts that fall beneath that 50% line, that that's the kind of action that may be deemed as motivated by discriminatory purpose. Uh -huh. And those claims are definitely still live under Section 2. So I think that we've got to be very wary about you know, what's happening on the ground and how Bartlett's interpreted and applied. And if we see the singling out of districts of that kind, and it reveals a pattern um, that smacks of discriminatory purpose. That you know, we need to go after that. The Texas case, though, would suggest that that's a hard argument to make because it's so easy for them to say, "No, we did it for a partisan purpose. We didn't do it for a racial purpose." It just so happened that that's where the Democrats were, and so we carved up those districts. Uh, you know, that's certainly what happened to the district in Fort Worth, right. which was carved into six pieces. Um, and, I, and and I think it's going to be it's difficult to sort of be able to separate those two strands, particularly in parts of the country where race and, and political affiliation are so, so overlapping. Right, but we've got the Supreme Court's te you know, test laid, set forth in Arlington Heights, and I think that um, you know, where there's a, a clear pattern that can't be explained on grounds other than race, mm -hmm. that um, folks like MALDEF and LDF may, may very well try to go after states that try to dismantle those districts. You know, again, as I was saying earlier, the CBC, uh, districts help, you know, the CHC districts are some of the most diverse districts in our country. We live in a, an intensely segregated world, but I think these are, are districts where we've got black voters living alongside white voters, and it's very important and healthy to our democracy, I think, for us to stand up and fight to protect those districts. I guess the other thing that would protect some of those districts is Section 5. In Section 5 jurisdictions, there's a very strong retrogression argument. Uh, I assume that's agree with that, Julie? You're nodding? <laughs> I'm, I'm nodding, but I think that there, there certainly is, I'm sure that people would make a retrogression argument, is what I would say. And there's no reason why it wouldn't right. apply to a district less than 50% district in right. I mean, providing Bartlett, rep actual right. representation to African Americans or minorities in general. Absolutely, because the standard after the, reauthor the reauthorized Section 5 makes clear the standard under Section 5 is the ability to elect. 
it isn't 50% plus. Is that going to mean that uh, maps like the one that was passed in Georgia where they replaced a smaller number of, of maybe 50% African-American districts with a larger number of 30 and 40% African-American mm -hmm. districts and the Supreme Court in Georgia versus Ashcroft said mm -hmm. that was okay. There's a certain amount of leeway. We're not going to call that retrogression. You can give representation in, in uh, kind mm -hmm. of different ways and different packages. Uh, essentially, is that, is that case mm -hmm. been overruled by Congress in the, in the reauthorization of I think Section the, 5? I think the Congress <laughs> tried to make clear in the reauthorization that the test is ability to elect and the test is not um, whether or not in response to Georgia versus Ashcroft, their test is not, um, is this a district where minority voters have an ability to influence? It's a question about whether or not minority voters have an ability to elect both in the old and in the new. And so as long as it's a district where uh, their candidate of choice, including members of their own group can get elected, that would still, that would be viewed as non-retrogression regardless of the specific percentage, is that the? I mean, I think what I will say is that right, Bart, the Bartlett rule about 50% is a section two rule. Right. And the rule under section five is an ability to elect rule. It is not a 50% rule. <coughs> well, I guess at this point, um, uh, we'd love to hear from you if you have questions about things that are gonna happen uh, down here in front. Oh, we have a microphone. If we could get that going first, I think that's more important that this be recorded for posterity <laughs> and at everybody here. Thanks very much for uh, coming to speak to us. I, I have a question about one person, one vote. Uh, we heard from Ms. Perales about the importance of um, having an equal number of people in each district, say in the state legislature, such that they can have equal representation and get the same services and benefits from their representative and have an equal chance of being able to contact the representative and get their help. And we also heard from uh, Ms. Hayward about the importance of every person's vote being equally weighted. And uh, that might suggest that there should be an equal number of eligible voters in every district so that everyone has the same chance of influencing the outcome of the election. And the Supreme Court in various places within uh, the Reynolds v. Sims opinion and then elsewhere has suggested that the Constitution demands both these forms of equality, of representational equality, and also of electoral equality. And so I'm curious uh, whether the panelists think that uh, there's any good argument to be made that both forms of equality are demanded by the Constitution's requirements and therefore there should have to be not only an equal number of people, but also an equal number of voters in every district, which may present some practical problems. I would but, say. <laughs> but, but could, 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 in, could in theory, I think, uh, be, be done, um, particularly with a sort of 10% or maybe greater leeway um, on, for, for either one. Um, and might the, the court's decision in Burns v. Richardson, uh, suggesting that the state of Hawaii could choose between um, kind of these two forms uh, be potentially subject to, to, to be overruled? Um, and I guess, is, yeah, is there any argument to be made that really both of these requirements have to be met or are the practical challenges just too significant? Who wants well, to tackle that? We're going to share the answer. Okay. Um, but I think we both agree it's impossible to achieve that in many places, and that's exactly where the issue is going to come up. If you can achieve both, well, of course. But let me just address the purity of the principle of equal weight of votes. It's impossible to achieve the equal weight of votes because you're not talking about equalizing the number of eligible voters, you're talking about equalizing the number of votes. You would have to redraw the lines after every single election to guarantee the purest equality of votes because voting isn't determined by eligibility, it's determined by turnout, and which is a product in part of registration, which is a product in part of eligibility. So, you know, when you hear people talk about one person, one vote, and they're being all purist about it, remember that that's an impossible, unless you're willing to redistrict every two years or every time you have a municipal election, you can't get there. But returning back to the original part of my answer, there are places where you cannot achieve both goals at the same time, and the city of Irving, which is right outside of Dallas and has a very high newly arrived immigrant population, was chosen specifically for this test case because you can't achieve both goals simultaneously. And I guess, I guess what I, how I would respond is that um, 
what I was trying to do in my comments and what I was trying to do by directing people back to Brown v. Sims is, is show that you know, the one person, one vote standard as interpreted as strictly as it's been interpreted has sort of eclipsed other interests that are legitimately recognized in redistricting like um, you know, civic engagement, voter turnout, um, communities of interest, you know, city boundaries, county boundaries, and all these other, all this other mix that, you know, even if you've got, you know, the, the sort of philosopher king well-meaning redistrictor of mm -hmm. sort of fantasy doing the best job they can possibly do for the state, none of these things can be um, pursued, you know, to, um, to, to, to perfection without sacrificing those other things. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I was trying to imply in my comments is that I think, you know, when you've got this, this one interest, this, this population equality interest that is the one that has been, um, you know, preserved in, you know, constitutional law now by the Supreme Court, you've, set, you've, you've lost some other things. And, um, and we might want to walk that back. Um, that's all. A couple of things. Just on the California situation, I'm from California. I would just like to point out the commission that Ms. Perales has very appropriately uh, dissected up on the table there. It doesn't at the moment apply to Congress. It only applies to the state legislature. And it doesn't, uh, though there is an initiative that will probably be on the California ballot that might put congressional redistricting under that commission. Okay. The other point I would make about Ms. Hayward's comment about you know walking back Kirkpatrick v. Price. I think that can happen to have some statistics from some congressional quarterly reviews of redistricting in the 1950s before residents were spent. I think what you're proposing would just get us back into a gigantic quagmire uh, where the thing about the population equality standard is a manageable one. Uh, whereas if you didn't have that, you would have districts that would vary before Reynolds v. Sims and the congressional redistricting. Texas 5, 951257, that was one of the largest districts in the country. The smallest district in the country was Oklahoma 4, 252208. Within states, you would have variations. In the 1950 round of the districts, Maryland 1, the Eastern Shore, 210, 623. Maryland 2, the Baltimore suburbs, 366962. You really want to go back to those kind of things, and the reason, if, and if you go read, and Michael Peroni is not by any means a flaming liberal. If you read his book, Our Country, he will tell you that had there been Reynolds v. Sims instead of Colbert versus Green, after the 40 and 50 census, the urban core voters would have been represented. In fact, if you look at the 1952 U.S. House elections where you had a 221 Republican majority, the Democratic numbers actually were large, were of the two-party vote were about 52%. But in the districting, it wasn't equal. So what I point is, the absolute quality standard actually is a judicially manageable one. It ought to be retained. I would even take it, if, if it were up to me, I would even get rid of the 10% rule on state redistricting. The reason is, is if anybody's worked in a campaign, shifting something 5% one way or another can decide an outcome. OK, thank you. We'll call that a question. Do you, you want to comment on that, Allison? Or? Do I think that population equality is not a value in redistricting? No, I think it is. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, the, uh, one, one argument you could make, though, is that the, the exactitude of the, of the congressional requirement is what ends up making you bisect every single municipal line, every single county line, every precinct. I mean, it, it, it does require much more jaggedness than you, than you would otherwise have if you had a little bit of leeway. I mean, that's an argument a lot of people make. Another question? Okay. How about over here? Hello. I was born in 1966. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> this is for Julie. Um, do you think that soon you will receive a rash of requests by Republican-controlled jurisdictions to opt out of Voting Rights Act Section 5 oversight? Um, well, what I know is that we have received um, some number of requests from a lot of jurisdictions. I have no idea who controls them um, to bail out of Section 5. And I think if a jurisdiction can meet the standards of bailout, they should bail out. So I think if a jurisdiction can establish that they haven't had, um, you know, the, they ha they've met the standards in the statute, they should bail out. 
There haven't been very many, though, have there? We have a we have more than we've ever had in terms of active bail. But, but we're still talking less country. than a hundred or something, right? Yeah. And, and right. you know, there's thousands of jurisdictions covered by Section Five. So. Well, I think, frankly, I think that our job would be. Um, in, on the whole, more manageable and easier if a lot of the jurisdictions that that are eligible to bail out would petition the court Which to bail out. Which is really out. small towns that you know don't have any history of problems. It's not even just small towns. Yeah. I'll tell you. I mean, there are there are a number of jurisdictions that I think meet the criteria and they don't bail out because they don't want to. But it would certainly make it easier for us if they did. They it's not a big deal. They, their burden is low. They submit. They are pre clear. They have low minority population. They have no. They have no record of problems, but they just don't. And they have to have no denials of preclearance in the past 10 years? Is that one of the requirements? Yeah, we do have, I mean, we have discretion to have sort of um, roundness to our uh, standard, so. I, I wanted to add that there are jur jurisdictions that prefer to be covered by Section Absolutely. 5 because when they receive preclearance, that is a, like a that stamp of approval from the federal government, and it, it helps them gain some credibility among their constituents that it's been submitted and approved. Yeah. So I think that um, feelings about wanting to be covered or not covered by Section 5 may not be all that closely lined up with partisanship, because right. I, I can think of some small democratic places that are just annoyed at having to submit, even though the paperwork is very light, and I think they're moving towards doing it online, so it'll be yeah. super easy. And then yeah. there are probably other places where, you know, there may be Republican leadership who enjoys the stamp of approval and, and the ability to sort of navigate their own politics that is, that is given by uh, preclearance under Section 5. And can I just underscore one other thing, just quickly, is that um, in this world of voting rights, as many of you, I don't know how many of you, <clears throat> but it is just so not either like a straight up Democrat, Republican kind of thing. Like, we just really don't know that's why I say I have no idea who could, the, who's control, what political party might control really any of the pending bailout requests that we have, or much of the work that we do. I just have no idea. I'm not that. I'm actually not one of those people that knows who all the governors are and what their parties are. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and and we have found over the years, you never know where. Um, why a jurisdiction for their political, whatever their political reason is, Democrat, Republican, Green, um, why they may be challenging a particular thing that we're doing or not like an outcome or want to bail out. So um, it really is not, some of our worst um, challenges um, have come from Democrats at, that have shaken you know, um, our statute and then some from Republicans. It's just not that simple, which is why we should just ignore it. <laughs> Up it over here in the back. Hi, my question um, is, I think for, for Nina Perales, but also maybe for the senator as well. Um, so let if we go into the future, we have Texas getting four extra seats. What does that mean for the representation of the Latino community in Texas? Um, how many of those districts will actually represent the interests of the Latino community? Is it that um, if you look at the number of people who are voting or the number of people who are eligible or voting age, et cetera, um, are those new districts actually going to represent those people or is that going to be a problem as well where you have people who are elected because you have these new districts but they're not actually representing the population that got them these new seats? Well, yeah, we don't draw those kinds of districts, but I'll let the senator go first. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my grandmother was a very wise person. She was born in Mexico and came when she was um, about eight, so she only went to the third grade, but one of her favorite things to say of all these little dichos, you know, these little wise sayings that your grandmothers always tell you, is el que sabe que no sabe sabe algo, which means if you know what you don't know, you know something. Well, in the case of actually drawing the, the lines, what we know is that we've got to draw the opportunity. And that's all we can be certain of. We live in a really complex world, and and our jurisdictions in our state um, are, are large. Um, my Senate seat, I'm close to 900,000 people. It's a large district. Uh, and believe me, I don't want to have a personal relationship with all my constituents. <laughs> I'm doing good just with my six kids and grandkids and, and a husband. So when you talk about the, and ask the valid question, what does this mean for the Latino population, the only thing we do know is what history has shown us, is that the opportunity to, to elect a Latino, and, and when we say Latino, it may be someone like, you know, Leticia San Miguel Vandepute, whose family's been here for nine generations, and it may mean another 
Latino who, as immigrant parents, or it, there's the whole spectrum. And I think that it is really with a disservice that when we look at the Latino community, we don't understand that there is great diversity among those. Um, and with this regard to sensitivity, history shows us and our votes in Congress and at the legislature shows that if you elect Latinos, they are more closely aligned with the district, with the people's priorities. So although it's politics, folks, it's about policy. It's about what happens when you get equal funding of schools. What happens when you start getting votes that deter youth from incarceration to alternatives so that they don't end up in that school to prison pipeline? What happens when you actually start taking care of environmental concerns where the waste dumps and all the, all the really ugly environmental stuff was always put in minority districts? That's where it makes the difference. And so it's about the influence that we can have to elect someone that will listen to the concerns of the community. That may or may not be someone who's of the similar ethnic or racial background. But the history has shown us that, in most cases, that's the only way you get the ear. So uh, I hope I've been able to answer for you, but uh, we think that the growth has been Latino. And of course, I'll have my colleagues that say, but they're in the Republican, I mean, they're in the suburbs area. Um, I think it's also a fallacy to think that all of our communities of color are just relegated to inner city. I'm going to tell you, if you look at some of those West Testic districts, the only reason they haven't been eliminated before is because of the growing Latino population. And in the suburbs, the, that's a growing population. It's not just you know the, the, the Anglo population that is moving. It, it, we are such a large number. So it's where those Latinos are located, and that's what I'm kind of talking about. And hopefully, we're going to get some great census numbers that validates it and gives us the opportunity to draw those new seats in Congress with an eye toward having people have the opportunity to elect somebody who's actually going to listen to them. I'd like to follow up specifically when we draw Latino opportunity districts in Texas and throughout the Southwest, it's usually because they're being compelled under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, right? So um, there's a, a long, complicated, but transparent process of going to court and demonstrating that the district meets the requirements under Section 2, which is that it has a majority. And in the Fifth Circuit, where we are, and also in the Ninth Circuit, where we do a lot of litigation, that's citizen voting age Latino majority then we have to further demonstrate that it provides the opportunity by using statistical analysis and reconstructed elections. So when I say Texas doesn't draw districts in the way that you had sort of described a hypothetically ineffective but so-called Latino opportunity district, we don't have those because we go through such a high standard of compelling these districts to be drawn. Um, the kind of district that you're describing hypothetically doesn't exist in Texas. All of our districts at this point that are congressional districts are Latino registration majority districts that are electing the Latino candidate of choice. And that is largely the case throughout the rest of the Southwest. So rest assured, if that was a concern, not happening. In the back on that side. Um, hi, this is a question about felon disenfranchisement. and. I was thinking it occurs to me that you know the argument that people in jail should be counted where they live or where they lived before, it doesn't really lose all of its force even if they do have full voting rights. So I was wondering if we could imagine like a theoretical state where you know the legislature does something and the next day basically everyone in jail, everyone on probation has full voting rights again. I'm curious if for redistricting purposes they would be counted where they're in prison or at home. And I'm also curious if they actually voted in an election, where would we count that, that vote as well? Um. Yeah, um, there are a lot of things that would have to happen before we got to the world that you just described. <laughs> yeah. I think um, you could probably count on one hand the number of states where persons who are detained can get to vote while incarcerated. Most states um, disenfranchise persons who are detained. We just got a very good victory um, in the Ninth Circuit striking down um, Washington State's felon disenfranchisement law, and that's currently um, 
uh, going to uh, on appeal, and. Um, there is a bill called the Democracy Restoration Act that's pending before Congress that would restore the right to vote to persons uh, for, who are not detained in federal elections, not getting a lot of traction. Um, so I, I, I think that the world you describe is very, very far off, and so I hesitate to kind of uh, come up with a hypothetical, <laughs> hypothetical answer. I mean, to me, if we can kind of deal with the real problems we got, kind of get states one by one to adopt um, laws that permit persons who are at, you know, at minimum not detained, get them the right to vote, that would be a huge victory. And in 2010, for purposes of redistricting, if we can count people uh, who are in currently incarcerated in their true homes, where their uh, constituents and representatives might uh, uh, you know, truly take steps to address their interests and needs, that would be a, a, a good victory, I think. That, I think, has to be uh, the last word. Uh, we are going to be around, though, for another 15 minutes or so for some informal networking uh, for those of us who want, those who want to hang around. Uh, in, in the meantime, let me just say there's a lunch uh, with Secretary of Homeland Security uh, Janet Napolitano following this panel at 1.15 in the ballroom next door. Additionally, there'll be a, a remarks by U.S. Representative Linda Ch Sanchez at uh, 5 o'clock in the ballroom, followed immediately by a plenary panel, Immigration Reform, Congress and the States, at 5.30. And the day will conclude with the welcome reception uh, uh, at state, in the State and East Room at 6.30. So enjoy your afternoons, uh, and let us thank the panel. Thank you.